you would have had to have been living under a rock the last six months uh, if you were not aware of the fact that climate science has become intensely politicized. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens whenever people perceive that there is a threat to either their political view, their religious view, their ethical view, their moral stance from something that's coming out of the scientific community. This is not unique to climate science. It's something that occurs with evolutionary biology. It's something that occurs with fishery science. It's something that occurs um, really whenever uh, science is, is seen to impinge upon uh, something that, that people are much more closely tied to than the scientific method. The consequence of these events or, or, or of this, this environment um, is that the media doesn't generally uh, see the whole picture. They generally see the science and they look at the science, the stuff that's going on in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, the stuff that's in the IPCC report or in the CCSP reports, uh, and they pass it for things that they think are of interest in the public debate. Now, the public debate is completely divorced from the scientific debates, but that's not to say that we've done a good job with communicating climate change or the science. We've done a terrible job. Um, it's basically because it's not our job. <laughs> that's, that's a big problem. Our ability or, or our capability of explaining to people why science is trustworthy, why the scientific method works, why the process that we go through as individuals in this competitive environment, in the technical literature, why that has any credibility, that's where we fail. And it really does come down to values and the decisions people want to make determine really influencing the messages they're willing to hear. So we may not like knowing that, but I think it's a tool that we can use to understand how to establish dialogue. Not manipulate people, but establish dialogue around solutions in ways that people are going to be comfortable. We've designed programming that, get, that ties together uh, the cosmic, the global, and local issues um, in an experience that people can really see the relevance of all these different scales in one immersive experience. And we're building a network nationally of people through museums doing this kind of work because we've realized that it's really this, the experience of seeing Earth systems that's going to, it, that is more effective in reaching people and getting away from these, uh, these diametrically opposed, politically motivated viewpoints. We can just focus on facts by establishing really a new frame of reference. And that's what kind of keeps me in visualization, keeps me inspired. What I would suggest then is um, a combination of the emotional and the analytic appeal. And um, here we have a slide of some 20 uh, time series of glacial retreat across the world. Um, and for most people, this would not be uh, very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, it would actually turn many people off. Um, if we want to get people engaged, uh, we should focus in on one of the time series and pick one point and see this is what this glacier looked like at point X, at time X. Uh, then we look at like there was an 800 meter retreat in length of this glacier. What does that look like? Try to show a photo. And then you can, you can go through multiple of these glaciers and, and try to show that. Uh, the information will never be as comprehensive as the time series, but you have, to, you have created a way for people uh, to want to know more what happened to this glacier. You can then ask uh, an elderly person who has been around for 80, 90 years to explain their experience with living near this glacier. Um, you can explain the impact of glacier retreat on agriculture downstream, um, or you can explain the impact on children's, on water availability and children's health in regions that are um, uh, downstream from glaciers. At that point, you may have people's attention so that they actually want to know why are glaciers retreating, and you can show CO2 emissions, how they have risen, and how they will continue to affect uh, temperature uh, increases around the globe. I like to take the optimist view. 
Uh, and I feel that we can improve the communication of climate change. We, there's, there's a lot that we can do. Um, and good behavior can be learned. A lot of our studies show that. If we, if we motivate the um, uh, uh, cooperation and appeal to social goals in people and appeal to regard for others, um, we can achieve cooperation and um, people will sacrifice some of the economic uh, interest for the social and environmental interest. And um, if we involve stakeholders very early on and through participatory processes, we can help tailor the information. And I think that is a key that we need to be uh, in tune uh, and in contact with our audiences very early on so that we find out what do people need to know uh, so that we can create information that matters to them and that they can then follow. So targeting is about identifying the people who are respected in different communities. And uh, the issue of whether or not they are vocally saying Obama is the Antichrist is a little bit irrelevant if they have decisions to make about their crops or their insurance premiums or something that touches their lives. And I think that what a consensus is emerging, or at least there is an emerging understanding that um, rather than talking directly about climate change, and it's always about climate change, you can talk about the ways that uh, complex environmental systems and their problems are manifestations of systemic processes that have other ties in to people's livelihood. I think, I think the key to what it is you're talking about is, is a realization why it is you're, what it, why you're trying to communicate with these people and what it is that you want to communicate. Now, um, and, I, and I have to kind of pull on something that, that you said, that communication was there in order to change behavior. Now, that is a reason to communicate, but it certainly isn't the only reason to communicate. And, and I think if we talk about the goal of communication merely to change people's behavior, then I think we can quite rightly be accused of being propagandists. If you want policies to be put in place or people to, to follow policies, you don't have to have everybody agree with the reason for that policy in order to get that policy done. And the question is, well, how, how do you, how do you um, build trust? And how do you uh, let people see what it is that you're doing, the process, the methodology. Uh, the issue is not about specific results. Um, the issue is not about trying to prove to somebody that the, that the trend in global mean temperature has been exactly 0.8 degrees centigrade over the last 100 years. Um, the issue is much more about, can you humanize this process? Who are the people that are coming up with these things? What are they thinking about? How are they thinking about these things? Showing that within science there are also multiple views. It's not just this, uh, we always think of this like a, a, a consensus. Like science itself criticizes itself. Scientists, that's how science works. Science criticizes uh, uh, other scientists. And so to show that there's, it's not just this one phase, this one image of the scientist. Uh, science is, is, is fundamentally about uncertainty, quantifying it, reducing it but it's never making it go away. Everything that we do in science is always about uncertainty. You know, even um, general relativity is not certain. Right? It's a pretty good, you know, even quantum electrochromodynamics is not certain. It's very good, but it's still not 100%, right? Nothing is ever 100%. And so I think it's much more important that, that when these kinds of issues come up and say, oh, we're so uncertain, that we, we just try and break the link that people have between science uncertainty. I think we do recognize that uh, communication requires a set of skills and expertise that is distinct from doing the science. And so building that capability, and, and I am intentionally distinguishing that from PR. I just think that actually translating science into usable nuggets of information for different populations is a skill and one that is going to require professional development and career building for this generation.